Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the COVID-19 Committee in 2021. The committee has received apologies from Beatrice Wishart, MSP, who is attending another parliamentary committee. Can I welcome Willie Rennie, MSP, who is attending the meeting as a substitute for Beatrice. The first agenda item this morning is a decision to take item three on the consideration of evidence heard in private. Our members agree, and if any member disagrees, could you please type N in the chat bar now? It appears that no member disagrees, therefore we are agreed to take agenda item three in private. I move on to agenda item two, COVID-19 next steps. This morning, the committee will be taking evidence on this from Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister, and Dr. Gregor Smith, the chief medical officer for the Scottish government. Can I welcome you both to the meeting? And first minister, can I invite you to make an opening statement? Uh, thanks very much, convener. I very much welcome the opportunity to join you today, along with the Chief Medical Officer, and we both look forward to the discussions ahead and to answering any questions you have on our overall strategic approach to COVID, uh, to the detail of the emergency legislation, uh, to the extent you want to get into that, and, of course, any other issues that are of interest to the committee. I'm going to keep these introductory remarks very brief, but um, I have got some of, not all, uh, of today's figures. Um, it's a bit early in the day for that, but I have some of today's figures, so I thought it might be useful to share those with the committee at this stage. Uh, yesterday, there were 691 new cases reported. Um, the test positivity percentage was 3.1 per cent. That is of all tests carried out. Unfortunately, a further 20 deaths were registered in the past 24 hours, which means that the total number of deaths under the daily measurement that we use is now 7,461. And I'm sure the thoughts of all of us are with those who have been bereaved over the past year. Uh, later on today, uh, National Records of Scotland will publish its weekly report on deaths, and also a bit later on today. The Scottish Government will publish the daily figures on the number of people currently in hospital and intensive care. What we know from recent days is that both of those uh, numbers have been declining, and hopefully we'll continue to see that trend in the days to come. Um, I'll give you also just the uh, information I have so far today on the progress of the vaccination uh, programme. As of 8.30 this morning, 1,809,158 people have received the first dose of vaccine. That's an increase since yesterday of 19,781. As I've said, uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, most recently yesterday in Parliament, a, a dip in the supply of the vaccine has resulted in a dip in the daily vaccination rate, uh, which you can see from the latest figure, but we expect to see supplies increase uh, from the middle of this month, and consequently, we would expect to see the daily vaccination rate pick up again as well. Uh, we have, though, now vaccinated virtually everybody in the over 65 year old age group, uh, and to date, 44 per cent of 60 to 64 year olds, 37 per cent of 55 to 59 year olds, and 30 per cent of 50 to 54 year olds. So we're still on track and expect to stay on track to deliver, uh, to offer first doses to all over 50 year olds, to all unpaid carers, and to all adults with an underlying health condition by the middle of April. Uh, the progress in the vaccination programme, coupled with the progress we've seen in suppressing the virus, does give us greater grounds for optimism now than we've had for some time. And it has also opened the way to get children in a phased way back to school. It also allowed me yesterday to set out to Parliament some very modest, but I hope important, relaxations of the restrictions in place, particularly around uh, our ability to meet other people outdoors. And as I said yesterday, next week, I will set out a, a more detailed, indicative timeline for the opening up of the economy. Uh, I think the final point, just to reiterate from my statement in Parliament yesterday, is that despite all of the positive news that we have to report and reflect on, we still need to be cautious. Uh, we still face a number of risks, and those risks will materialise if we start to come out of lockdown more quickly than the vaccination programme is giving protection across the whole population. Uh, the virus that we're dealing with now is more infectious than the one we were dealing with as we came out of lockdown 
Last year, the new variant accounts for around 90 per cent of all new cases in Scotland right now. The R number is below one, but we do not believe it to be very much below one. Um, and therefore, as we start to ease restrictions, there is a risk it goes above one again. So we need to be very careful in what we do. And obviously, as uh, you can see from the information I have shared today, although case numbers have fallen significantly uh, at 691 today, they remain higher than we would want them to be. So having the virus circulating at that relatively high level, although much lower than it was, it poses a risk that as we start to ease restrictions, it runs out of control again. So all of that means that we have to be careful, cautious uh, and very considered in what we do, so that the progress that we are making out of lockdown continues to be a steady progress. It might not be as quick as all of us would love it to be, but if we get the timing of it right, we hope it will be steady and in one direction. Uh, rather than us suffering setbacks along the way. So I think I'll stop there. Obviously, um, there will be lots of questions the committee wants to get into. Perhaps my, my very final point, given that this will be the last time uh, I imagine I appear before this committee in this parliamentary session, is just to take the opportunity to thank the committee for all of the uh, work that it has done, an immense amount of work over the last uh, year in very unusual circumstances to apply uh, scrutiny to what the government has done on an emergency footing. I know it's not been easy, but the government usually uh, has appreciated uh, the contribution and the input of the committee. So let me just end by conveying my thanks to all of the members of the committee for that. Thank you, First Minister, and thank you for those comments um, that you, you made at the end there. Um, we will now move to questions. Members have about 10 minutes or so each to ask questions of witnesses. So, as ever, can I ask that questions and answers are as concise as possible? And if there's time for supplementary questions, I'll indicate that once all members have had a chance to ask their questions. And also, if members could indicate who their direction, their questions are directed towards, this will assist broadcasting. So if I can now turn to questions, and if I may ask the first question, the current aim of the government is to return to the level system on the 26th of April, which is about six or seven weeks away. In light of the vaccine rollout and the progress that we seem to be making, can I ask what is preventing us returning to a localised approach more quickly, particularly given that the level system still allows the government to apply rigorous protection measures, but also take account of local circumstances? Um, in short, it is, uh, I think, uh, an appropriate degree of caution. Um, we have not yet, in any part of the country, well, perhaps islands would be an exception to that, and the, there are parts of the country where prevalence is much lower than it is in other parts of the country, but we still have a virus circulating at levels that are too high for comfort. We also know that this variant of the virus that, as I said earlier on, accounts for almost all of the virus circulating in Scotland right now, certainly around 90 per cent of it, is much more infectious. We know from pretty hard experience in the final part of last year and the first part of this year that it spreads and transmits very quickly. We do not have experience yet of how far and fast that variant will spread as we start to lift restrictions. And while we are making really good progress with the vaccine programme, but 40 per cent of the adult population is now vaccinated, we need to get that percentage higher to have a degree of protection from the vaccine that will substitute the protection from lockdown measures. So we are being, I think, rightly cautious to make sure that as we start to lift these restrictions, uh, we have as much certainty as we'll ever have in a situation like this that we're not immediately going to be uh, overtaken by the spread of the virus. It's also the case that we are taking some quite significant steps right now through return to school, and we have uh, substantial numbers of primary school pupils already back full time in school. That will increase significantly from next week. 
We still don't know uh, what impact that is having on transmission. Uh, we are monitoring that carefully, but given the, the life cycle of this virus, it's too early to be definitive. So we, we just need to be cautious. The last thing we want to do is to go faster because we're all impatient to get back to normal and find that it sets us back. So we live in some or all of the country with these restrictions for longer than is necessary. Um, my final point, Gregor, uh, may want to add something here as well. Um, I hope, and I'll set more uh, of our thinking and expectations around this out to Parliament next Tuesday, um, but I hope as we come out of lockdown measures, initially we can come out uh, as one country. That, uh, and then in future, if we have outbreaks or flare-ups, we can use the level system uh, to, uh, to, to deal with that. But I hope at least some of and, and some substantial parts of the easing of lockdown can apply all across the country. It, it may very quickly be possible for some parts to go faster, and I'm talking there, island and rural communities perhaps in particular. Uh, but you know, as, as I said in my initial statement, the, the exit from lockdown, and I think this is true UK-wide right now, may be slower than any of us want it to be for good reason. But my focus and priority is to try to make it steady and one directional, uh, rather than going too fast now and finding that we take one step forward and two steps back. Now, I can't guarantee we won't have to do that, but I think a bit of caution at this stage is the best mitigation and protection against that that we've got. Thank you for that. I don't Great. know if the Chief Minister wants to add, add to that. Thanks, Mr. Cameron. Yeah, very happy to expand just a little bit here because I think that we are dealing with a very different situation than even that we were facing um, last summer as we began to exit lockdown at that stage as well. The, the virus that we are now dealing with is a completely different uh, virus in many respects, certainly in the way that it behaves, than we have become used to. And while we take this very considered, measured approach in terms of how we begin to change the restrictions that we have been living with, it is really important that what we do not do is we do not tip the balance in its favour again. And there is a very real risk that that will happen if we move too quickly uh, and, and at too wide a scope as well at this point in time. The virus that we are now dealing with is somewhere between 30 and 70 per cent more transmissible um, than the, the virus that we have been used to dealing with. And it is right that we just take that little bit of extra care and attention to make sure that we are um, examining all the data that is available to us as you say, to make sure that we don't tip it, uh, the, 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 the balance in, in, in the direction of the virus, to allow it to be able to really get a foothold as well. I am very conscious of the fact that as we exit um, some of these restrictions just now, we still have a fairly high level of um, virus circulating in this country. And it would not take much if we were to really put upward pressure on our just now to, to really begin to see transmission begin to take off again. So I think that, that this is the, certainly the safest way of making sure that we have a sustainable exit from these measures and that we do not find ourselves um, having to, to, to kind of reapply them um, quickly afterwards again. No one wants to see that. Um, th thank you for those those answers. And perhaps uh, sticking with the chief medical officer, can I move on to the the vaccine rollout, which I think we all accept is dependent on supply. But once the initial priority groups are complete by say the middle of April, what is the expected weekly vaccination rate in Scotland going to be, and when would you expect the the adult population to be completed, especially with the Moderna vaccine hopefully coming online quite soon? So the, the weekly vaccination rate is going to be wholly determined by the, the supplies that are coming into the country at that point in time. And um, at this point in time, I don't have um, the, the detail that far ahead of, of exactly what those numbers are going to look like. But we've certainly got the capacity just now to be able to, to deal with um, really significant proportions of, of vaccinations um, on a daily and weekly basis so that we can get through this vaccination programme as, as quickly as we all want to see, because we all recognise that the sooner that we provide protection, uh, 
beyond these initial nine groups that we have already identified through the JCVI and into those age groups which are under uh, the age of 50 as well, is that we are likely to see very much less uh, mortality and morbidity um, around about the country. So we will be keeping close touch with both um, the other UK nations, UK government, and also the suppliers to make sure that those um, vaccine supplies, as soon as that pipeline begins to open up again, as the First Minister has already outlined, is, is, is that our um, health and social care workers across the country are able to get those vaccines into arms as quickly as possible. Thank you for that. Um, my final question is about the potential extension of the emergency legislation. And last week, the committee heard some quite powerful evidence from Inclusion Scotland, representing disabled people, and the Scottish Police Federation, who, from very different perspectives, were of the view that instead of simply extending uh, the legislation uh, after a year where so much has happened since that legislation was passed, there was a strong argument to take stock and see what had worked and what, what hadn't worked, especially um, given the impact on, on civil liberties. And I just wondered, First Minister, if you have any comments on that. Um, before I go on to that, just to maybe complete the, the last question, we are hoping um, to get back up to around 400,000 uh, vaccinations per week as supplies permit uh, to meet that mid-April target. We almost we were Due to get there um, a few weeks ago, the, the snow uh, meant we fell just short of that. And our aim, again, supplies permitting, is to complete the whole adult population uh, with the first dose, offer the first dose to the whole adult population by the end of July. Um, so that are, th these are the targets we are working towards. All of it is supply permitting, but we are you know, reasonably confident that we can meet that end of July target. Um, look, I've got a lot of sympathy with the, the question on emergency legislation. Um, people you know, might be sceptical about politicians saying what I'm about to say. I, I don't want emergency legislation to have to be in place for a minute longer than it has to be. Um, we are still in an emergency situation, though, so it is still important that we have a degree of flexibility and adaptability that is commensurate with that, which is why, obviously, we think the extension is appropriate. Um, we look very carefully at each provision of the emergency legislation to make a judgment on whether it is appropriate and proportionate to continue with that. And you know, There are some provisions that uh, we have uh, already decided uh, to change. Uh, this extension, of course, would be to September. There is no provision without further primary legislation to extend uh, beyond September, and obviously that would be for the incoming administration after the election to make judgments and assessments about. But while, um, as I say, this is the bit that might attract some scepticism, and perhaps my body language does not always uh, suggest uh, that I mean what I am about to say. Proper, normal parliamentary scrutiny is what we all uh, aspire to get back to around all of these things, because it makes for better uh, legislation and better decisions. Um, we need to, though, make sure that we hear the voices of people that are most affected uh, by the emergency provisions that are in place. We will do everything we can to ensure that disabled groups are uh, included and heard when we are designing and delivering uh, new policies. Um, we have got some good experience uh, from the past when we consulted on reforms to the Adults with Incapacity Act about making that an accessible uh, process. So there is much work to be done there, but given the degree of emergency we continue to face, having a, a legislative framework that allows government to properly respond to that I think is necessary, appropriate and proportionate. Thank you for, for those answers. Can I turn now to the Deputy Convener, uh, Monica Lennon, for her questions? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, First Minister and Dr Smith. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we heard a lot, not just in Scotland, but around the world, that we're all in it together. But of course, we know that that's not the case. And we know that um, the pandemic has highlighted the disproportionate impact of the virus on people from low income uh, backgrounds. So can I ask um, what the government's done to address that, and what further targeted targeted action is planned to help to reduce um, inequalities? Um, I'll uh, kick off with that. So 
I, I mean, we are all in this together, but very quickly, I think it was very obvious, and it should always have been obvious, that our experiences are not the same. Um, you know, people who have secure employment, you know, comfortable home environment, uh, plenty of space to work from home, uh, are in a much uh, easier position. I don't think anybody during a pandemic is in an easy position, but an easier position than somebody who's living in cramped accommodation, who's worrying about how they pay the bills, um, and you know, perhaps doesn't have uh, employment or who has lost their job. And obviously, the exacerbation of pre-existing inequalities has been very obvious as well. Um, right from the outset, and I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through every single detail here. Although the committee, if it doesn't have it, can be provided with it. We have provided uh, targeted investment to try to help uh, those who, who need it most, those who are already living in poverty or in uh, positions of inequality, and those for whom these situations developed through the pandemic. So that ranges from uh, the additional money uh, to local authorities to support service delivery, uh, money that we made available right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, I think. £140 million pounds, uh, to tackle food insecurity. Uh, we uh, developed the winter hardship payment, again, putting money in the pockets of people who needed it most. We put additional funding into the Scottish Welfare Fund. We established the self-isolation support grant. Uh, we added additional funding to the discretionary housing payment fund. We uh, made additional payments to carers uh, through a, a specific coronavirus carers allowance supplement. Um, and of course, we invested a lot in connectivity and trying to uh, deal with uh, or mitigate the digital divides. Also, things like making provision of free school meals available uh, through the, the holiday period. Uh, the budget that has just been passed in Parliament for the year ahead uh, continues with a lot of support of that nature. Um, I think that is dealing with the immediate situation. Uh, what it has highlighted and underlined for me and for the government is the need to really focus on many of the things we were doing already uh, to try to tackle uh, poverty at a fundamental level and some of the driving uh, causes of poverty. So the Scottish Child Payment, which has launched through the pandemic, was planned before that. Um, we have since, certainly um, from the perspective of, uh, of my party in terms of post-election, uh, to commit to free school meals uh, for all primary kids all year round. Uh, so there is a real need to make sure that we are powering on with some of these uh, really important measures uh, to tackle inequality. But I think there's also a need for us to, to continue to look with a fresh eye at some of the new inequalities that will have been created by the pandemic and how we best respond to them. Thank you, First Minister. That's that's helpful. One of the measures that the Parliament passed through the emergency legislation was the social care support fund. That was one of my amendments. I was really pleased that the Parliament um, could agree on that, and in particular, I thank Jean Freeman for her cooperation. I wonder if there's been any analysis by government of the uptake of that fund, and if there's any plans to to try and extend that that um, benefit to other workers or other occupation groups. We know that um, there are so many workers who struggle to self-isolate because they're worried about the, the affordability of that. So I just wonder if you can maybe provide figures, if not today, but provide figures to the committee on the, the uptake to that fund, please. Um, so I, I don't have figures uh, available right now. I will uh, check what degree of analysis has been done. Um, often, as you know, it takes a bit longer to properly sort of analyse the, the uptake and the impact of, of a relatively new provision, but I, I will uh, see what we have available that can be uh, provided to the committee. I think that is an, a good example of a, a targeted, uh, bespoke solution to you know, a problem that became very obvious as the pandemic started to unfold. And it is also an example of some of the things we did um, specifically because of the pandemic, that we will want to consider whether we effectively make them permanent on an ongoing basis. Because as well as uh, you know, highlighting some pre-existing inequalities, this has created new inequalities. So just going back to everything as it was before this crisis hit us, I, I don't think is appropriate. So we need to do some you know, serious thinking as we move forward about the things that we have had to do because of the pandemic, you know, out of necessity, 
to what extent do we want them to become part of the mainstream offer? Thank you, First Minister. Um, you gave us a helpful update on the vaccination programme at the start, and again, thanks to, to all the staff who are involved in the, in the rollout. Can I ask, um, in terms of both ethnicity and deprivation, just about data and how the public can access that? Um, I can't find data on uptake levels by ethnicity, so I just wondered if that information is available to the public and MSPs, um, and if not, if that can be made available. And also, I know in terms of deprivation quintiles that there is information available, um, but it's not on the public health dashboard. Is that something that can be changed? So we're still developing the, the granularity of the the data that's provided on the vaccination programme. It's already developed since the programme started, but it will develop further. Uh, it, it takes. It does take a bit of time to get the sort of robustness in the data that Public Health Scotland and others are are satisfied um, about publishing. I will uh, ask Public Health Scotland to provide some forward-looking information about what they can consider will be possible in terms of further breakdowns of data. Gregor may uh, be able to say something about that right now. In terms of the, the, the issue generally, we have been aware since the outset of the importance of making sure that this vaccine is uh, taken up, the, the vaccine offer is taken up by you know, high percentages of the population across all sectors of the population. And we've been very aware of uh, the, the possibility and the likelihood of greater degrees of you know, what we refer to as vaccine hesitancy in some parts of the population. And you know, ethnic minority communities certainly um, are one such group. Now, I should say at the outset, uh, we've been if anything, uh, pleasantly surprised by the, the uptake uh, of, of the vaccine in the groups that have been offered vaccination so far. They have exceeded all of our expectations and levels of vaccine hesitancy, I think, across all parts of the population seem lower than we might have thought uh, they would be. But obviously, we uh, have been and will continue to work alongside you know, faith, third sector, community groups to make sure that we are reaching all parts of the population. Um, you know, groups like Bemis, for example, have been really uh, vital to make sure that the, the information we're giving out in vaccine is, is accessible, that it's culturally appropriate, and crucially, that it's been delivered by trusted voices in particular communities. Um, obviously, we know there's been a disproportionate impact in, uh, on COVID, of COVID generally on ethnic minority communities. So some of what we are already doing tries to take account of that, you know, testing centre in Glasgow Central Mosque, for example, uh, is just one of many examples of, of how we're trying to take account of that. We had the expert group uh, look at these issues uh, for us uh, during last year, um, the expert reference group in COVID and ethnicity, and our priority and focus is on taking forward all of the key recommendations of that. So it's a key part of making sure that the vaccine provides the maximum protection that we know it can do if everybody or as many people as possible take it up. But Gregor may want to say a little bit more about ethnicity and data. Thanks, First Minister. Yeah, Public Health Scotland are cu currently working through the, the granularity that we can achieve with uh, some of this data. Just now, they're looking at all aspects of this um, as to how we can drill down to get more inf more information about the different groups who are receiving the the, the vaccine. And um, uh, I, I would hope that we will be able to report uh, more progress on that in the near future. I, I want to, to kind of pick up particularly about this point because it's it's really really important when we're considering the impact that the pandemic has had on widening some of the um, inequalities, particularly the health inequalities that we've had within this country. If you look at the example of pandemics over history, um, pandemics have always struck disproportionately uh, those who already suffer inequalities within countries, whether it's the Spanish flu or um, the late um, 19th century, whether it's the, 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 the great flu after the, 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 the First World War. Um, it has always been those who have um, already had some sort of disadvantage that, that, that have suffered disproportionately. It's really, really important, therefore, that we make sure that no one is left behind, particularly as we begin to exit some of the particular um, high levels of the, of the cases that we've had 
over recent months. That's why I think it's really important that we continue to maintain and pursue the strategy of elimination, where we get as close to suppression and low numbers as, as, as we possibly can. Because if we tolerate those higher numbers at all within our society uh, as we begin to um, finally exit the impact of the pandemic. Um, if we do that, it will be those who already suffer inequalities in society that will continue to suffer the impact of coronavirus as a disease. And therefore, it is absolutely critical that we do not leave anyone behind in all of this. Thank you, Dr. Smith and First Minister. In the interest of time, I will pause there, Kimir, but I might have some supplementaries if there is time later in the session. Thank you, Monica. Our next questions come from Mark Ruskell. Mark. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, good morning to you both. Um, First Minister, I wanted to ask you about the self isolation support and in particular the self isolation support grants uh, you know it's been very welcome that the uh, eligibility for those grants has been widened now on two occasions uh, and it's also welcome that through budget negotiations that concluded this week that there's now more budget to support the uh, self isolation support grants um, but I wanted to ask you about whether these grants should be universal because obviously as we start to move through this pandemic, fewer people will be self-isolating going forward. So the, the, the financial commitment on government will be less. Would that be a good point to say that this grant should be universal? I think so I, I wouldn't rule that out. So in print, let me start from principle. Uh, I guess uh, there is an argument that I would not be unsympathetic to if the Scottish Government's budget was unlimited, that we make self-isolation payments universal, so that there is an application process um, and you know, everybody has access to it. So we, we focus on getting everybody the support rather than working out eligibility. We would not have the, the financial cover and wherewithal to, to pay for that at times when the levels of, of virus and the numbers of people requiring to self-isolate are anywhere near what they have been in recent times. Obviously, as as we suppress the virus, as we are doing right now, and if we get it down to levels that are closer to the, the latter part of, of last summer, then financially that becomes uh, more possible. I suppose I, I just have a question in my mind about making something universal uh, when the virus is very low, um, and, then, and, and we hope this won't happen if we had a surge again not being able to continue that because we didn't have the financial cover. So, you know, I think there's just some issues that we need to, would need to consider there. I, I, I don't rule it out. We have, I think, our uh, responses thus far has demonstrated that we want to make the financial uh, payments and the financial support available uh, available as widely as possible. So, as you rightly said in your question, we've extended eligibility now on two occasions. I, I don't rule out doing that again and on a further basis if the, the case for that is made. I do think important though financial support is, and it, it is really important, people have to put food on their table and, and pay uh, their bills. So that is arguably the most important part of the support we provide. But it's not the only part. It's really important that people who might be living alone get support if they need it to get essentials delivered. And as has been raised by some of your colleagues before, if people need to be put up an alternative accommodation to self-isolate, that there is a provision there as well. So I think we've got to see this as an overall package, but I am certainly not um, close-minded to what more we can do to try to improve that provision overall. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I wanted to turn to the uh, Public Accounts Committee, uh, the, the, the Westminster Committee uh, that has reported today. Um, focusing on the UK PCR testing regime. Um, I mean, one of the conclusions the Commission came to, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, read it out, is that, that the UK government should wean itself off its persistence, its persistent reliance on consultants. Is that something that, that you recognise? Is that something that, that you've been concerned about? Um, I, forgive me, Mark. I've not had the opportunity this morning. I've been doing other things to, to read the uh, PAC report. Um, I'm, I'm sure I will read it later on. So I, I've not had the opportunity to see 
uh, those comments in context. Um, so, speaking from the Scottish Government's perspective, there are times, um, and particularly over the last year, where we have used the services of consultants because we needed to supplement uh, capacity and capability that we had in house, and we had to do things very quickly. And, and that will be necessary. You know, we use consultants, uh, I think, appropriately. Or some would say too often, and I'm very mindful of that in normal times as well. Uh, so it's, it's important that we we do that. Has that been uh, too frequent, or have we over relied on consultants? I think we need to, to take a, a kind of proper look at that to answer that question definitively. I hope that's not the case for the Scottish Government. We've done some things very differently to the UK Government, so there will be differences, uh, I think, here. And our approach to test and protect is, is one of those. Um, you know, what test and protect does, and the purpose of it, and the fundamentals of how it works are very similar to test and trace in England, but we built test and protect effectively from the bottom up, from our pre-existing very localised public health teams and the contact tracing, much, much more limited contact tracing capability that we had in place. So we you know we didn't build the kind of whole brand new, almost sitting outside the NHS system that has been uh, done in England. And I'm I'm not an expert on that, so won't comment in detail. So we have, I think, tried to work with the existing infrastructure that we have in Scotland as much as possible. But because of the speed with which we've had to do things, because of the, the scale of the infrastructure that we've had to put in place, often from a standing start, we have had to draw in external help at times. And that's not always been consultants. We've drawn in uh, logistical support, advisory support, both on Test and Protect and more recently on the vaccination programme from the armed forces. Um, so I think given the challenge we faced, that was necessary and appropriate. But it's, it's one of the many things uh, that will deserve proper, detailed scrutiny and accountability when hopefully in the not too distant future, we're at the point of looking back on this pandemic and not still living through it. Mm. But, but specifically in terms of that UK-wide PCR testing regime, have you been able to feed in? Has your government been able to feed into how that scheme has been rolled out? Uh, yes, um, we have. I, I will not shy away from saying we've had frustrations along the way. I've voiced some of them. We've, you know, found uh, at times that we faced backlogs in the the Lighthouse Laboratory network that has, you know, we feared had an impact on our ability to quickly identify and then do the contact tracing and isolation of cases. And when we've had those problems, we have tried to work through them with the UK government. We have obviously been very involved in the location of the, the, the testing centres, the, the drive-through centres, as well as the, the mobile centres, the walk-through centres that came at a slightly later stage. So, yes, we have been uh, very meaningfully involved in all of that, but we, you know, we took a decision at the outset that for speed uh, and for as much efficiency as possible, operating within that UK-wide system was was the right thing to do. That has also then delivered frustrations. Now, some of these frustrations we might have had regardless, uh, and we'll continue to try to work through these as constructively as possible. Some of the issues that I've just spoken about there in terms of PCR testing backlogs, uh, luckily sitting at a wooden desk, so I can touch it as I say this, uh, have have not been a feature for you know quite some time now. Um, so hopefully we won't go back there. Um, and you know we, we try to work through problems when they arise as speedily and as constructively as we can. Mm. Okay. Um, finally, can I ask you about occupational workplace testing? I mean, you know, we've seen uh, testing obviously extended to NHS staff, care workers, now teachers uh, getting asymptomatic testing on a twice weekly basis. We, we had the the police federation in the committee last week. And I was quite frankly surprised to hear that, you know, frontline police officers are not getting regular testing. I find that quite incredible, especially given the scenes that we've seen this week and, and the amount of work they're having to do, breaking up mass gatherings, uh, and as well as continuing with their, their everyday duties. Um, is there not a case to say that if, if, you're, if you're in a workplace, you're needing to go back to work, 
Um, you're in close proximity with your colleagues. You're in cr close proximity uh, with members of the public as well, as teachers are, that you should be getting an asymptomatic test twice a week, or at least that should be available for those employers. I, I don't get a sense of where the strategy is at the moment. Um, it didn't seem to be clear in the framework that you announced a couple of weeks ago. So we have substantially extended the the reach of testing. You uh, referred to some of that in uh, your your question. Um, so you know, extended to you know many many more uh, people working in the NHS, uh, not just in hospitals but across primary care uh, into care homes, for example. And uh, we have. Uh, recently started to expand testing into some uh, sectors in the private sector, like food processing and distribution uh, premises, where we know from past experience and just the, the nature of these environments that there is a particular risk of outbreaks. Uh, we are now offering twice-weekly testing to um, all people working in education and uh, initially to senior phase pupils in secondary schools, but we have uh, indicated recently that Post the Easter break, that will be for available for all uh, secondary school pupils, and we remain open to extending that uh, further uh, as as far as we can. Now, what I've spoken about there is predominantly lateral flow testing, which are these rapid tests that give you the result in you know 45 minutes or so. Greg, correct me if I'm if I'm getting the, the detail there wrong. Uh, they are quicker than PCR tests, uh, but they are slightly less sensitive and reliable than PCR tests. So if you test positive through one of those, the advice is to get it confirmed through a PCR test. Now, why can't we just give these twice weekly to everybody in the population? Is we, we don't have the capacity to do that. We've got good supplies of lateral flow device, devices, but they're not unlimited supplies. So we have to work out the, the priorities based on uh, the the, the perceived and actual risk that people are at, and our priorities in terms of opening things up, and you know, healthcare staff, uh, schools, some really high-risk working environments have been the priorities that we have focused on thus far. But that doesn't mean it's this far and no further. We want to, as far as the capacity we have allows us to do to extend the use of testing, because it is, together with vaccination, one of the biggest, most effective tools we have got in our toolbox, other than just all of us staying at home all the time, which is not sustainable. One of the things I will end on this point, because Gregor might want to say a word or two on, on testing. Um, we, we always, while testing is really important, and this is something that I have felt very strongly almost since the, the, the outset of the pandemic, is that we must never ever see testing as as a magic wand solution, um, and I've always had a concern that if we if we encourage or create a sense that if you get tested on one day you're free and, and you're negative you're free to kind of go and act however you want then we create a false sense of security in the population that will have really damaging counterproductive uh, effects. So we've always got to balance carefully. Testing tells you at a moment in time. That you don't have, or that you do have the virus, or that you don't have the virus. It doesn't mean you're not incubating the virus and might test positive the following day, and it doesn't mean that you won't walk out of wherever you are and get it transmitted to you by somebody else. So we've got to see testing as the effective tool it is, but be careful that we always see it in the round um, and don't think it is a panacea because it unfortunately is not. Hmm. I mean, just before Gregor comes in, I, I, I do recognise that, First Minister, but you know there are, there are still questions about why there isn't a, a strategy. If you have a limited number, a limited capacity for asymptomatic testing, you know beyond care homes, beyond the NHS and food processing businesses, where are those priorities? Are, are, is, is the is the police a priority within that? Uh, we, we certainly will talk to the police about the, uh, the the possibility of that. But you know, where are the priorities? So schools, uh, people working in education, and secondary school pupils have been the, the the significant big priority for using that capacity to you know give the added reassurance that certainly the the strong feedback from teachers and others uh, was that that would be very welcome. Uh, we are doing. Uh, 
quite a, a substantial amount now of community asymptomatic testing, uh, so encouraging people to go forward to for testing whether or not they have symptoms. So it, it's not that we, you know, we've got lots and lots of capacity that we're just not using because we we don't want to use it. We are trying now. People will always have different views on whether our chosen priorities are the right ones, but we are choosing them carefully and we're choosing them on the basis of uh, assessment of risk and also uh, what is most important in terms of giving levels of assurance to get really important things opened up, and that's obviously one of the key factors with schools. Um, does the Chief Medical Officer want to come in here uh, briefly? Yes, I would be really keen. Um, despite the fact that we're over 12 months into this pandemic, we're still learning an awful lot about this virus and the various um, uh, new variants of the virus which, which have come forward from it as well. And, and, and one of the really important areas where we continue to develop quite a great deal of evidence is about testing and what that means. And as we're using more and more of the lateral flow devices and other rapid um, diagnostic techniques, then, then we're getting much more confidence in using those as well and, and sure of uh, that, that the results are actually uh, portray what is the, the, the true picture of uh, what's going on with the virus uh, as well. So as that confidence builds, it's right that we continue to review the strategy, and we're in the process of doing that just now, so that we've revisited that strategy in light of all the new evidence that we've gathered, so that we can bring forward what is the next evolution in terms of how we approach testing across the country. And it's right to think of this as a multi-layered approach, because testing is only one part of that multi-layered protection that we can offer to people as they go about their, their kind of everyday business gradually as we get back to normal. Um, the First Minister touched upon something there which is really important from some of the evidence which is beginning to come through, and, and that is that there is some evidence which is now showing that when people are subjected to regular testing, they are perhaps um, less diligent in following some of the other protective measures that we have in place, so the physical distancing, the regular hand washing, um, the simple measures, which are probably even more important in terms of those layers of protection than, than, than even the testing uh, uh, alone. So there is a balance that needs to be struck between how we use that. But, but I do believe that testing is going to be firmly with us for some time yet. And as this evidence gathers for us, we will kind of have further iterations of the strategy over time that allow us to, to kind of be more confident uh, that we're increasing the protection for people, particularly as they get back into the workplace. Thank you very much. Um, our next questions come from Willie Rennie. Willie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, last week in Parliament, uh, I asked you, First Minister, on school reopening and how teachers were going to cope with just one third of the class in at any one time. But now there are problems with the plans that are emerging. There's lots of angry parents out there. Uh, the amount of education for S1 to N3 seems to vary from one day a week being typical down to one hour and 45 minutes for some. Uh, many have not still been told, even though the schools are supposed to be opening uh, on Monday to them. Most parents think this will adversely impact the quality and the quantity of the education. And this morning, I'm sure you've heard that Jim Thewlis from the Scottish uh, School Leaders um, Association has described it as counterproductive and cobbled together. So, are you going to go ahead with Monday for secondary schools with the proposed arrangements? Uh, yes. Um, I, I again, this is one issue where. I appreciate there will be different views. There will be people out there who think just put all young people back into school straight away. Um, I don't think that would be the right approach because I think it would potentially uh, lead to an increase in transmission that would uh, allow things to start to run out of control again. And there will be other people who say keep all secondary school pupils on remote learning for a longer period. Uh, we want to get young people back into school full time. Uh, we achieved that in August, and we think that can be achieved again. And our aim is for that to be uh, possible after the Easter break. Uh, obviously, it's going to be uh, the reality from Monday for all primary school pupils. For secondary school, we had uh, from the 
implementation of the first phase, prioritised in-school learning for senior phase pupils to uh, support national qualifications, and they will continue to be the priority. The judgment we had to make was whether we just decided that uh, for the lower secondary school, we, we said there is no in-school provision until after the Easter holidays, or tried to get some, even if it is limited, uh, between now and Easter. And we opted for the latter because there is, I think, and we will all have young people in our own lives in that age, or many of us will, in that age group, and we will all see and be concerned about not just the educational impact of being out of school at 100 per cent of the time, but the well-being impact as well, being separated from friends and from normal life. So we decided to try, even if it was limited, in the period between now and Easter, to you know, get young people uh, back into school for some periods and to reacquaint them ahead of the, the Easter holidays. Uh, we always said that would be limited and there would be local flexibility in how that is, is delivered. And I appreciate the, the pressures that puts on teachers and, and local authorities, but we are trying to get back to full-time uh, provision of education as quickly as possible and to recognise the need to introduce, even if it is partial and even if it is phased and even if it is limited, greater degrees of normality for young people uh, from now uh, onwards. So I, you know, on this as on everything else, there will be very legitimately different views expressed about the right and wrong thing to do. There is, there is nothing perfect here and there is absolutely nothing uh, that is ideal living through a global pandemic. We are trying to balance these considerations in the best way possible. You won't get me arguing about the needs of mental health, First Minister, but this does seem a, an incredibly complicated plan for what is just weeks, and especially when children have lost out in a huge amount over the last year on their education. And teachers are pretty clear, and the school leaders are pretty clear that it's going to result in a diminished uh, ed educational offer for these two weeks. So, is it worth the candle doing this? Why, why have we gone through such a complicated process? Was there not another way of getting the interaction between pupils to deal with the mental health issues outside the school hours to make sure that that was dealt with, rather than impacting on their education in the way that has been set out here? Um, I, I, I suspect if we had tried to create some alternative provision there, uh, which you know, I, I am not saying is an illegitimate suggestion, we would probably be having a similar discussion on a, a different set of, of circumstances that you know there was a, a, a differing provision in, in some local authorities. We had we not tried to get some provision uh, between now and Easter, we would the alternative would not have been because the the data would not allow this. And Gregor can comment if he wants on this. His advice to me would not have supported this. Um, we would not have been able to, to say to secondary school pupils. Everybody can be back full time by uh, from the, the 15th of March. So it was a choice between some limited provision or no in-school provision at all. Now I, I appreciate there will be different views on that, and I appreciate if you're in the front line of education, anything that tries to, to do something that is partial and, and limited is, is more difficult to deliver than than the alternative. But that judgment about, and you know, as I say, many of us will have have family members in this age group. Every week, right now, that I think a young person of, of that, you know, 12, 13, 14 age group is completely out of school. It's not just about educational impact. I think it is about, and you, you're right to say you, you know all of this as, as well as I do, and are an advocate of this. It is, it is the mental health. It's their ability to interact. It's their, their relationships. That are are suffering. So there's no. I'm not going to sit here and say I think it is a hundred percent, you know, the best thing to do, and the other thing was absolutely the wrong thing to do. These are all balanced judgments, and it is perfectly legitimate for people to say we've struck the balance in the wrong way. Uh, but I think you know, for the the interest of trying to reintroduce young people, given how long they've been out of school. Before we get to, I hope you know this is not guaranteed yet, but I certainly hope that full time return after the Easter break. Um, those were the reasons we opted to, to seek to do that. Well, the, the many many parents who contacted me this morning um, are very clear that this is not 100% correct, and it's going to, I think, have an adverse effect on their education, according to them. 
So but I want to move on to, to zero COVID. Um, I've heard you talk about stricter indicators for the next route map and also that you support a zero COVID strategy. Um, you have said that the measles model is more what you want to follow rather than the fit. But measles was first discovered in the ninth century. It took to 1963 to get the vaccine, and we weren't clear of it in terms of eliminating it in the UK until 2017. So how long would it take for COVID to be eliminated in Scotland under your measles plan? I, I think, with the greatest of respect, I don't have a measles plan. Um, I'm using broad analogies, and actually, the medical officer is uh, the person who, first of all, suggested that it was more akin the nature of COVID and the impact and effects COVID had make it more akin, in his view, to uh, a measles type approach than to flu. Uh, but I'll let Gregor talk about that in his own. But that doesn't mean to say we're following an exact model of measles. Th these two illnesses are not the same. But I'm, I'm not a clinician and I'm not a scientist, so I'm just going to speak uh, as, as a politician, but you know, as, as how I see these things. Um, the one thing we've learned, and I'll, I'll put this in, in non-scientific language, the one thing certainly I've learned, Gregor would always have known it, is with a virus like this, what you absolutely can't do, and I don't think there's any country that has been successful in doing this, you can't just say we're going to let it simmer at this kind of medium level, like a sort of you know gently simmering pot, uh, because it won't behave like that. It will quickly decide its boss, and it will run out of control and start to boil up, as opposed to simmer at the level that you decide that your health service can cope with. So you can't have that kind of approach. You know, we'll just accept X numbers of cases a year and X numbers of deaths and X number of, of hospitalizations, even if that was ethically right, which I would question, the virus won't behave. It won't play ball with you like that. So you have to have an approach, in my view, for this virus of saying our objective has to be to eliminate. Now, even if you don't quite achieve elimination, it is the act of trying to get it as low as possible that keeps it under control. Um, because anything else is, is, is trying to do what I've just described there as impossible. To decide there's a level you can live with and hope the virus cooperates with you, it won't. It will run out of control if you let it. So the only sensible strategy for me is to say we need to get it as low as we possibly can. I call that elimination. That might mean we don't because we've got, uh, you know, even though we're trying very hard to uh, to protect in this way, we've got open borders. Uh, we've, you know, got a four nation approach within the UK. Uh, we may not get to the point where we eliminate it absolutely completely, but the act of trying will get us closer than we will if we don't try, and be more likely to allow us to keep it genuinely at levels that don't overwhelm us. So. You know, that's my layperson's way of describing this. And I would just caution against saying that it is absolutely the same as flu. I just I think to say it's like flu is, is perhaps the biggest mistake uh, because what we've very much learned about this virus is it's not flu. Um, and therefore we need to see it as something that we do need to keep it as as contained as possible, more like measles, although it's not identical. And it's about, you know, how how do you get it as low as possible by trying to eliminate it? And even if you don't succeed in elimination, you hopefully succeed in keeping it genuinely at levels that you can cope with. Gregor, that was an entirely layperson's approach to explaining elimination. I, I and it was a, it was very good. I could talk for this on ours, Mr. Rennie, uh, and I think it's a really important subject because it gets to the heart of what is the critical path that we're going to be taking over the next couple of years, in particular, in terms of how we deal with this virus and the pandemic. And actually, what's our role as a country, as part of that global collective, that can uh, take action to try to uh, limit the damage that the coronavirus causes on, on a worldwide basis as well? Um, I wouldn't call it a measles plan either. I think it's, it's, it's wrong to make that direct comparison. Measles is a much more infectious disease than coronavirus. Um, it's still responsible for 140,000 deaths a year worldwide. But if you compare that to flu, which uh, in, on an average year would be responsible for 650,000 deaths worldwide, you can see that there is a magnitude of a difference in terms of the impacts that it has on populations. And part of that is because of the way that we manage it. 
Now, one of the key differences here is with measles, the world has taken on this challenge to try to eliminate it. Now, what we mean by eliminate is not to eradicate the virus. It is my view that we will not eradicate coronavirus. But what we can do, in a, particularly on a regional basis, and it gradually expand that uh, internationally, is, is, is that we can drive these numbers down to as low a level as possible, so that it has as little impact on communities as is possible, bringing its morbidity and its mortality. And if we can do that, we can then manage the outbreaks just as we do when we manage measles, because occasionally we still see flare-ups of measles in the UK, across Europe, when case numbers begin to rise again. And that's where the public health infrastructure that we've now built up very strongly comes into play in order that we use our test and protect, our um, knowledge of isolation, our general public health measures to try to make sure that we um, kind of deal with those outbreaks on a, on a localised basis. Now, there's still some key data that we are missing in order that we can say that this is a fully plausible model. But we're getting more and more confident that actually it's, it's a model that lies open to us. One of the key elements of that data is actually what is the impact of the vaccines that we're currently deploying at scale on transmission? Because if they have a high impact on reducing transmission, and if we can then um, vaccinate um, a high, significantly high proportion of the population, then what we will begin to see is that population protection that really suppresses the ability of this virus to be able to spread within communities. Now, Scotland can do that. We can make those decisions um, and, and take that path. But what is really important is that we see this global collective action to take that same path. I heard um, Tony Fauci, um, who has become well known, and uh, the, the US chief advisor to uh, Mr Biden, speak about this uh, only in the last 10 days or so. And again, he was advocating this very same approach, that collectively, globally, if we take this action, if we take these choices at this moment in time, then what we can do is we can limit the impact of this disease not just in our own countries, but we can do that on a global scale as well. Why is that important? It is really important to go back to my earlier point here. We must leave no one behind in this. Because if you look at the impact that an infectious disease like flu has every year, you will see once again that flu picks out and preys upon those who have the most disadvantage already in their lives. It exploits those inequalities that we spoke about earlier. Now, I am not ready to um, take Scotland down a route where it exposes those in our country just now who, to, to those um, widening inequalities that are, yeah, another infectious agent would, would, would cause, while there is still an opportunity to try to make sure that we um, eliminate this and take it off the register and within Scotland as one of the potential um, big infectious agents. And while we have got that opportunity, and I think it is becoming more realistic every day with the kind of data that we are seeing from, from the vaccine programme, is that is an, uh, an opportunity that we should continue to, ex to pursue uh, quite vigorously. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, could I turn next to Annabel Ewing, please? Thank you, convener. Um, and good morning to the First Minister and to Dr. Smith. Returning to the issue of um, uh, what would be an appropriate degree of caution in easing lockdown, um, I was struck by reports of um, a, a, a meeting of the House of Commons uh, Science and Technology Select Committee uh, earlier this week, uh, and the comments in particular of Chief Scientific Officer in England, Sir Patrick Balance, who seemed to be making the point that polit politicians would be flying blind, he said, if they do not have a five-week gap in, in easements of, of lockdown to allow sufficient uh, analysis of data uh, collected during that period. And I just wonder, if the, in the first instance, if the First Minister could comment on that in terms of the applicability of that comment or otherwise as far as the approach being pursued in Scotland is concerned. Thank you. Again, the CMO might want to say something about the, the appropriate periods of time to give yourself the ability to monitor changes. We have always said you, you, you need that time. Yeah, I said earlier on, we, we still do not know for sure the impact that the partial opening of schools has had. So we've always 
uh, we've tended to work, although we, we did weekly reviews when the level system were in place at the end of the year, but in terms of making actual changes, we've tended to work in you know, at least a three-week cycle, and that's what we would uh, anticipate as a minimum as we go into this next phase. There may be arguments, um, and we are thinking through all of these things just now, about making that slightly longer, uh, given that we are dealing with a virus that is you know, it's, it's the same virus, but because it's a much, much more infectious variant, uh, we don't have the same understanding as we had developed last year of how it, it spreads and transmits. But certainly, that minimum uh, three-week period uh, between, certainly between significant easings, there may be minor things that you can do um, in shorter timescales, is certainly our planning assumption. But the CMO, CMO might want to add to that. So I think we've all become used to the fact that our data lags when, when it uh, comes to, to this virus because of the life cycle of the virus, and, and, and um, you really need a gap of somewhere between three to five weeks uh, in order that you can uh, begin to see exactly the impact of any change because of that life cycle. Um, it's, it's about balancing the, the, the various um, risks at play here, uh, because we still want to be able to take a proportionate approach to be able to uh, make sure that we don't keep any of the restrictions in place for any longer than they're absolutely needed. So three weeks is is a good balance where you're able to really see the impact of any opening up by that point in time. People have come together by that point in time. If they are going to begin to re-establish any chains of transmission, you will begin to see that coming through in the data, uh, particularly in the kind of cumulative case numbers that we see on a seven-day basis and the test positivity, but also in other signs and, and, and um, data that we use as well, such as evidence of surveillance from uh, testing either within uh, other parts of the community, within uh, the, the kind of wastewater that we have across Scotland, and, uh, and, and SIPA and Scottish Water have been superb in putting together a programme of surveillance at their sites, which allows us some very early warnings of um, some, some developing um, hotspots of infection around the country. So all of these things are put together and just allow us that, more, that little bit more confidence that Actually, by the time you're getting to that three-week stage, um, you, you're able to assess what the impacts of those uh, change in restrictions are. I, I thank Dr. Smith for that uh, uh, further detail to the First Minister's initial answer. Uh, also at that House of Commons Select Committee meeting this week, um, Professor Chris Whitty, so Dr. Smith's counterpart in England, uh, warned that another surge in England, and I hope I'm not misquoting this, but this was the way it was reported, that another surge in England, uh, I think he said, will be inevitable when lockdown in England is eased. So perhaps, again, I could go first to the First Minister, just to, um, to, to see what she feels may be the implications uh, in that regard for Scotland, and indeed what planning may be in place uh, to, to tackle such an eventuality, and then maybe Dr. Smith would like to comment afterwards. I mean, Gregor will give a much more, you know, expert scientific answer to this. I mean, I, I heard um, Chris Whitty's comments yesterday. I, I think, and I think he, I think he's right to be quite blunt about the risks that still lie ahead. This, this pandemic's not over. The, the virus is still there. It is still a matter of how we keep it under control. Um, and one of the just realities of an infectious virus is that every time, you know, right now we're controlling it largely through people staying away from each other. Um, the more you ease restrictions so that people are coming into contact more with each other, cases will will increase. Um, and that is just a, a truism and just a reality of how infectious viruses spread. So every every uh, restriction we ease and lift we will increase the, the, the ability of the virus to transmit. So basically what we need to try to do, and that this is not, certainly if it is, it has eluded me over the past year, it's not a perfect science. You have to try to do that in as careful, as cautious, and as phased a way to sort of reintroduce the normality while you keep the virus at as low level as possible. Because go back to what I said to Willie Rennie, the virus will not just hang around at a particular level to, you know, to keep you happy. It will get going as fast as it can. So we've got to continue to try to, to limit that. I, I hope we can do that without another surge. I can't guarantee that, 
but that's what we are aiming to try to achieve here. The thing we've got that we didn't have when we came out of the first lockdown last year, of course, is the suppressive effect of the vaccine giving people uh, immunity. Now, we still don't understand enough about how much immunity that will give, how much it will suppress transmission. All of the early indications are promising and positive. So, hopefully, uh, as we ease lockdown over the next few months, the, the vaccine, even as we start to live more normally, will keep the virus suppressed. But you know, getting all of these moving parts in perfect equilibrium to avoid it running out of control again is not easy, which is why we need to be very, very careful about it. I, I really hope we can avoid a surge because we get all of these bits working as well as possible together, but nobody can guarantee that. And therefore, you know, going back to an earlier point I made, we are still in an emergency situation. We've still got to have the ability to plan for all eventualities as we try very hard to keep this momentum going in one direction only and getting to a point where we can all live much more freely. Hopefully, although I'm not sure this is conclusive in terms of scientific opinion either, but hopefully as we go into the spring and summer, you know, the, the, the slightly better weather conditions help a little bit with that as well. But we're not out of this yet. This is a global pandemic. Many other countries are still much more in the grip of it than even we are. And the idea that we can just uh, you know, throw caution to the wind and stop worrying about COVID, unfortunately, is not quite the position we're in yet and may not be in that position for some time yet to come. Thank you. First of all, I don't Go ahead. Uh, every time I just say I would strongly associate myself with um Chris's remarks yesterday. I think it is a possibility still uh, that we will see a, a further surge uh, later in the summer, most likely. Uh, we have seen modelling which shows the path towards that, and so much is dependent on how all of us respond to this gradual reopening of, of society that we are undertaking just now. Uh, if, if we um, lose the sense of caution that we have so um, carefully guarded for so many months, um, then it is very quickly going to re-establish um, high levels of infection again. We have to remember just the proportion of the population that remains susceptible to this virus and its infections just now. And although we have provided protection to those um, who are most vulnerable within society, it does not mean to say that we have protected to uh, given that protection to everybody yet who could be susceptible to this virus, and we will see uh, more cases of infection, with all the implications that that also has for some of the long COVID syndromes that we are learning more and more about all the time, if we are not careful in terms of the way that we um, begin to reopen up society. I thank Dr. Smith and the First Minister for those answers, and I know my, I've got a minute left. I think, convener. So I would last, like to ask one last brief question to the First Minister, and taking into account all that we've just said about the need for caution. But I think it's a question that a lot of women uh, across Scotland would want me to take the opportunity. Um, big uh, question: When can we go to the hairdressers? And First Minister, if of course you're not able to give us a specific date this morning. Are you able to indicate a date that we might be able to know when we can go to the hairdresser? Thank you. Uh, I'm not able to give you the date. I can give you an absolute 100% assurance, though, that I will not delay our ability to visit the hairdresser uh, any longer than is necessary. Because I, I'm saying that out of pure self-interest, as anybody looking at me can see. Um, there are still conspiracy theories that circulate on social media uh, from time to time that I've got a secret hairdresser somewhere. I can say, firstly, that's not true. Um, but secondly, I don't know how anybody looking at me right now can reach that conclusion. No hairdresser is responsible or would take responsibility for this. So hairdressers, just as quickly as it's possible to do. Thank you. Well, we'll take some co uh, co uh, confidence from that and encouragement from that, First Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Annabel. Uh, our next questions come from Stuart McMillan. Stuart. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, First Minister and Dr. Smith. Uh, my first question is probably more towards Dr. Smith. It's just it's regarding comments from earlier regarding uh, Willie Rennie's questions. And uh, it's just regarding that the living with COVID uh, at some point in the future. I take it it's, it's still too early to determine 
that whether the, the, there will have to be either an annual vaccine or a regular vaccine uh, for COVID. Uh, maybe it's something akin to also the flu vaccination that takes place on an annual basis. Okay, um, I don't know if I've been taken off mute yet. But I hope you hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, yeah. I, I I think it is, it is highly likely that we will get into regular vaccination updates for um, coronavirus, for this SARS-CoV-2 virus. But at this point in time, um, I don't think that we can say with confidence what form those updates might take. At this moment, we still don't know all the truth about how long the immunity that the vaccination confers lasts for. And once we begin to have that data, we'll be able to see exactly what um, any kind of um, update or booster program uh, might look like. One of the reasons why I think it's really important, what, and, it's, and it's almost inevitable that this will eventually happen, is already we're seeing um, a great number of variants of the virus beginning to show themselves, many of which are now showing some convergence in terms of the mutations that they're showing around about points of mutation which confer an advantage. Now, that advantage might be because it increases the transmissibility, or the advantage might be because it allows it to escape the immune system just now. So we've got this um, a group of what we've been calling kind of racers and escapers or evaders. Um, that, that are now seeing increasingly across the globe just now. And I think for that reason alone, it's almost inevitable that we will eventually uh, get into the realms of update programmes for the vaccination um, o over time. As I say, what, what frequency we will have to do that just now is still a little bit up in the air, Stuart. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I take it, then, uh, with that uh, consideration, that you mentioned also that the testing will be with us for some time. Uh, would you imagine that the, the testing that some time, I think that's not just going to be uh, the rest of the year, that's po possibly going to be maybe a few years uh, hence? I mentioned before that, the, the, that one of the really important things is that, is that we're taking global collective action, and that um, as well as leaving no one behind in this country, we leave no countries behind across the globe as well. And I think for that purpose, uh, countries across the globe um, are preparing themselves for vaccination campaigns, for testing programmes, for tracing programmes, which are likely to last uh, more likely in, in terms of years rather than, than any months. I think it's very likely that um, things will get much, much better than we're experiencing just now. I have no doubt in that, of that in my mind, because the, even just the impact of the vaccination programme just now gives me that confidence that things um, are already beginning to improve significantly. But we've got to remain really vigilant for the presence of some of these variants and what impacts that they might have uh, on our communities. So keeping that infrastructure in place so that we can respond to that if necessary, and able to scale it up quickly if it becomes necessary, is, is something which is is really important. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, my next question is to the First Minister. Uh, First Minister, I had a meeting with the, the Finance Secretary uh, up to the budget, and one of the things I, I was asking for was a review into uh, deprivation in Inverclyde. Uh, and uh, as you be very aware, also Inverclyde has, uh, has suffered greatly uh, throughout COVID. Uh, not the only area, I accept, but it certainly has. Uh, and certainly, with that, uh, with that review, I mean, you look at the, the other um, areas that have got the high level of of S SIMD uh, data zones. Uh, four of them uh, are certainly on the on the Clyde, the Inverclyde, Glasgow, North Ayrshire, and West Dunbartonshire. Um, is there, when we do get out of um, COVID, when we start to move the country forward, uh, has there been any thinking uh, been given to providing additional assistance and resource to these four local authority areas, but certainly predominantly in my own, because that is the, the worst area in terms of SIMD, uh, to try to make them more uh, economically resilient uh, and socially resilient, to, uh, to hold, also help build up each of the, the local authorities. So, in short, in my answer to that question would be, yes, we should, uh, because the, the link between uh, deprivation and impact and effect of COVID is, is there uh, for everybody to see. It shouldn't surprise us because you know the reasons why uh, people living in deprivation were more likely to get COVID, more likely to become seriously ill, are things that we've known about for a long time. Poor housing conditions, uh, you know, poverty, 
poorer in relative terms health, so people more likely to have other uh, underlying conditions, comorbidities that in relation to COVID have made them more susceptible to serious illness. So I, I think it's one of the lessons coming out of this. Now, I said earlier on in relation to another question, a lot of what the Scottish Government was doing pre-COVID has been, I think, seriously justified by COVID. And if anything, the lesson has to be we need to do more of it and need to, to do it more. So our commitments to new affordable housing, for example, the work we're doing through the social security system, particularly the new payments to try to lift children out of poverty, how we design and implement the jobs guarantee for young people, all of these things, some of what we are uh, looking at in terms of placemaking, the you know, 20 minute neighbourhoods, uh, investment in regeneration, all of that. It's not new, it hasn't come about because of COVID, but COVID should make us understand even more than we did before how important all of this is. Now, how that all translates into actual budget allocations, we need to consider that properly as far as uh, funding to local authorities is concerned. We obviously need to discuss and agree any uh, changes to allocation methodology with COSLA. So, you know, translating what I've just said into the nuts and bolts takes some proper work and consideration. But, you know, this pandemic, if, if this doesn't make us in a whole range of different ways sit up and take notice and, you know, those of us who recognised were, these were problems before COVID to do much more even than we were doing to tackle them and to those people who perhaps had their head in the sand and didn't want to see that these were problems before COVID to now understand just how serious issues of poverty, deprivation and inequality are. And you know, we can, if, if five, ten years from now, the experience of this pandemic hasn't led to some fundamental changes around many of these things, then will have failed to make sure we have learned and applied the right lessons. Well, thank you for that. I think there is one other element I would like to add on to that, and that is the Certainly, in the Inverclyde area, with the ageing, the growing ageing population, uh, and with uh, uh, the, the fewer numbers of younger people uh, here in the area, also. So, I, I know that, that um, last year, at the very outset of COVID, the, the numbers of individuals and the, the age demographic of individuals who were getting COVID uh, were mainly the older people within. In Inverclyde community, uh, and the office in Inverclyde, like North Ayrshire, like Western Bartonshire, and Argyll and Butte, uh, have got very much population decline, uh, and, and that's been it's not just over the last five years or ten years. That's been the last thirty years, certainly in Inverclyde's case, uh, to lose uh, some what thirty-five percent of your of your population. Uh, there's something more sy systemic uh, that's sort of underway there, of course. Uh, so, in terms of the Obviously, when we do get out of COVID uh, and that thinking, I, I do accept your point regarding the local government funding, uh, and uh, I accept that as a as a challenge. Uh, but, um, but but I certainly would uh, try to impress upon you of you know, maybe other assistance that, that could help, particularly in, in areas such as like tourism, um, where obviously North Ayrshire and uh, certainly North Ayrshire and Argyll and Butte are, are a lot better, a lot more sustainable as compared to my area. But my area, uh, there is a, there is a potential there, and some uh, maybe additional assistance in terms of tourism could certainly help to stem that decline of population, increase more people coming in, uh, and then help to make the economy uh, and the community a lot more sustainable. I, I agree in principle, and I think we have to, to to take all of these things and and put them into practice. I, obviously, I, I know you understand this. I can't give specific commitments on these things right now, but they are very much part of our thinking, um, for all the reasons I have already set out. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, and, uh, one final question. It is in a totally different area, and uh, it, it possibly is too early uh, to, to answer this, but I uh, will ask it nonetheless. Uh, it is to do with Euro 21, uh, obviously, and the, also with the, the four matches that are due to be placed, played in Glasgow at Hamden. Uh, and uh, I would assume that discussions are still very much underway between the Scottish Government, uh, SFA, uh, and UEFA uh, before any final decisions uh, are to be taken as to whether those matches are to take place. 
Uh, you, you're right. Discussions and considerations are under we, um, not just for Scotland. All the countries that are due to host matches are, are grappling with the same things. There are deadlines by which we have to give an indication to you. If I think that's uh, sometime in the early part of April. Um, so I, I can repeat what I said last week. I can't really go much beyond this. I really, really want these matches to go ahead at Hamden, uh, and I would really love for them to go ahead with uh, some spectators there to. To see them, and particularly to you know Scotland for the first time in uh, a long, long time. Um, so that's what we're really focused on, um, and we'll do everything uh, to to bring that about. Uh, but you know, obviously, sitting here right now in what still early March, getting towards mid March, uh, it's not possible on on not just this on anything to give hard and fast, definitive answers to this. But there is absolutely uh, no. Uh, suggestion other than that we want these matches to go ahead. Um, and I certainly would love to think uh, I'll be there cheering on Scotland and Hamden with uh, more than a few others alongside me, uh, if that is safe and possible to achieve. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Um, our next questions come from Morris Corey. Morris. Karina, thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, First Minister and Dr. Smith. Um, First Minister, first question for yourself. Um, what value has the report from the Citizens, uh, Citizens Panel had on the government's consideration of future strategy? And also, can you point to anything in, in it, uh, particularly, that you would like to take forward from the panel's recommendations? Uh, th thank you. I found uh, the report of the Citizens Panel both uh, fascinating and really, really useful. And you know, through you uh, and other members of the committee, I want to take the opportunity to thank them for that. I think it's given the, the Scottish government a lot of insight and also a lot of food for thought. Obviously, they've made a lot of recommendations, and we will consider all of them carefully. But just to you know, highlight perhaps some of the key areas of focus. And in all of the ones I'm about to mention here, there are either areas where I would say we are already aligned with the views of the citizens panel or areas where we will consider very carefully how we better align our policy. So, you know, they were very clear on the importance of an elimination strategy, which, as I've set out in response to Willie Rennie, eh, is very much the the approach we're taking, and I set out the reasons for that. They had lots to say about the need to define a COVID strategy for 2021, which is also uh, work that we are uh, very much engaged in. Uh, they talked about the need to balance the four harms, but to recognise and prioritise the direct harms from COVID, which is very much in alignment with our approach, because uh, if, if we do not do that, then everything else becomes much worse, and that is how we uh, limit the overall harm. You know, they had recommendations about enhancing targeted testing, which we are doing and we will do more of. Uh, one of the things I uh, was very interested in, and we've tried to build this into our messaging already, is the need to explain to the public that even as vaccines roll out, what the risks are, vaccine escape, mutation, uh, such like. So we've already tried to reflect on that. Um, Prioritising vulnerable groups through the rollout of the vaccine, you know, we're doing that guided by the JCVI. So there's a whole I could probably talk for a long time, but you won't want me to. Um, there's loads in this that we are reflecting carefully on, and I think it will be of huge uh, assistance to us as we move into this next phase. Good. Th thank you, First Minister. Could I ask you a follow-up question? Um, it's in relation uh, to the Law Society of Scotland and. Uh, would you support an inquiry, as recommended by the Law Society of Scotland, into the fitness of the legal legislative of the legislature, of, of the le sorry, the legislative framework and policy to deal with the future public health crisis that may arise? In, in, in principle, yes. I mean, I think it would be remiss and, and wrong of us as we eventually get out of this crisis. We've got to get ourselves through this crisis. If we do not then look back critically at almost every aspect of our handling and think about what we got right, what we got wrong, and how we better, as a result of this experience, prepare ourselves for future health crises. Because the one thing we know for certain is there will be future health crises. I certainly hope none of us uh, live through another global pandemic. Um, 
although I have to say as a minister, it's the second one uh, I've uh, had to, to deal with, uh, and obviously this one much more severe than, than swine flu back in uh, a number of years ago. So, in short, yes, I agree with that, and I, as I've said publicly before, that there needs to be a, a, a full public inquiry that is capable of looking at all aspects of this, but underneath that there will be specific discrete areas that we want to, to look at in particular, and probably on the issue you've raised, how, how fit for purpose was the emergency legislation framework, it may be that actually it is a parliamentary committee in future that is best placed to do that kind of detailed work for us. Yeah. So, plenty of lessons learned and things like that will be produced uh, in a sort of post-exercise report, as you might say. But that is fine. Thank you, First Minister. Very kind of you. Thank you. Can I turn to Dr. Smith, please, my final question? And it is in connection with Inclusion Scotland. Now, in Inclusion Scotland, Dr. Smith suggested easing of social care assessment duties in the pandemic, uh, and it has had the unintended consequences of permitting cuts to existing social care support packages. How can we ensure that this does not become part of the new normal in the long term, from your point of view? So, this is a really important issue that we just need to make sure that, um, that when we, whenever any of these um, issues are um, raised with us is, is that we're following them through and hearing, particularly from those who have experienced the difficulties from their point of view and learning from those where it's necessary to do so. Um, it's, it's, it's something which we will continue to do in terms of the way that we engage with um, these groups and uh, we'll feed that back in through our uh, different policy areas who deal with those. And, I am very happy to take part in any of those discussions to make sure that those type of assessments are not having a detrimental uh, impact on people. Dr. Smith, just a final point. Are there any areas that are jumping out at the moment to you in relation to this, this question? Uh, Mr. Collier, there, there are no areas that are jumping out to me at this moment, but if there is anything that you would wish to highlight to me separately, then I am very happy to hear from you. Right, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much indeed, First Minister. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Kavina. Thank you, Morris. Our next uh, questions come from Willie Coffey. Willie. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Kavina. Good morning, First Minister and Dr. Smith. Um, First Minister, I wonder if I could invite you to say a few words on the sort of international dimension to the vaccination programme. Um, but firstly, I'm looking at the live feeds of our committee meeting this morning, and it's really interesting to see. That the hypodermic syringe was invented by a Scotsman, a Dr. Alexander Wood in the 1850s. Something that makes us all particularly proud that the mass vaccination programme across the world started with that invention in the 1850s. Um, but you only have to take a quick look at some of the charts around the world to see how well we are getting on in terms of the vaccination programme. And it is perhaps no surprise that many of the countries in Africa have not even started. The vaccination programme as yet. Do you think there's more that we need to be doing to assist the international community so that Western economies, modern democracies, or whatever, do a bit more to help the vaccination programme along a bit across the world? I, I absolutely do, um, and I think it's a really important question. Um, we're really pleased, all of us across the UK, at how well our vaccination programme is going. It's exceeding. Our expectations, and every country wants to vaccinate as a priority their own populations. That's that's natural. It's the responsibility of of domestic governments. It's my responsibility to get the Scottish population vaccinated as quickly as possible. But we kid ourselves on if we think that just vaccinating our own population solves a global pandemic for us. We will be in this global pandemic as long as other countries are in the global pandemic. So. You know, we need to. We have a shared interest. It, this is not just something we should be doing out of altruism, although there's nothing wrong with that, and that is important. But we actually have a selfish shared interest for wanting to see countries across the entire globe get themselves uh, vaccinated as well. Uh, we are already uh, doing, uh, taking some action. I think we can all do more. So through our international development funding, the Scottish government is already helping to prepare uh, health systems in uh, countries like Malawi, Zambia and Rwanda for the distribution of the vaccine. So that's something that we are supporting through 
our existing international development programme. Uh, we're doing that uh, more broadly than vaccine. We've been helping some of these development partner countries uh, since the start uh, of the, the pandemic. And since I think around about September last year, we've uh, carried out a review of the approach we're taking to international development in light of COVID and ring fence some of that fund to support specific uh, COVID responses. Um, beyond that, the UK, uh, and I think this is a really good thing, is participating in the international effort to reach uh, out to other countries and help with vaccination of other countries. I think the uh, the programme is called COVAX, um, and the UK government announced last year that the UK would participate in that. Um, the rollout through COVAX has started in a number of African countries, uh, including, I think, Rwanda, are already see receiving allocations through that. And I think the UK government has confirmed already that the majority of any surplus vaccine uh, will be uh, sent to COVAX. Uh, what's less clear is when that will actually start to happen. So there's lots being done here. I think the UK, because of the, the success, frankly, of the, the vaccine procurement and obviously the vaccine delivery, is in a really strong position to show international leadership on this, and I, I certainly hope that working together we will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. and can you see already the benefits of America rejoining the WHO? I know they are a major contributor to COVAX as well. Are we beginning to see the benefit of that even this early in terms of President Biden's administration, do you think? Uh, yes, um, I, I think we're, we're starting to see the early benefits of that across a whole range of, of things. You know, climate change. I sitting in this very chair had a a, a video conference on Friday with John Kerry, uh, President Biden's climate envoy. That has is already transforming the ability to really start to see the potential for brokering international agreement. And the same is true here. We've you know gone from having a, a U.S. president that seemed to think his uh, one of his many uh, malign purposes in life was to undermine the WHO and take funding away from the WHO to an administration that now sees the, the value and the benefit for all of us in having that international collaboration. So I think that is really hugely positive and, and will bring practical benefits as well as helping to improve the, the general environment in which those collaborations happen. You know, don't don't get me wrong. I think as we come out of this global pandemic, just like we want to look back on everything else, the you know the WHO and the the operation of the international health regulations, there'll be some questions we want to ask in light of experience about how these things can be improved and and strengthened for the future. But I actually, principally from my experience during swine flu and and uh, underlined during this experience, I'm a big big supporter of the vital role in international health. Of the WHO, I think it does an invaluable job, and our focus as an international community should be strengthening that, not in any way weakening it. Mm -hmm. And bringing you back to Scotland, and specifically perhaps First Minister to Ayrshire, do you envisage when we are able to um, introduce more relaxations? Can you see us going back to? Health board boundary areas, or will we still stick with the local council boundary areas? Many people in Ayrshire, as you know, um, cross the three Ayrshire council boundaries fairly frequently. Well, they don't at the moment, but they're looking very much forward to the ability to do that to visit friends and family. So, when we get to that relaxation point, do you see it still being council boundary led or local health board boundary led? So I, I'm always delighted to be taken back to Ayrshire, <laughs> the, the place of my birth. There is only one Ayrshire, although as we both know, Willie, there are parts of Ayrshire that are uh, better than others. But uh, I won't go any further uh, down that track. But what you've just described there in an Ayrshire context, you know, my own family is in that position of right now, uh, and you know, families across the country are in that position of of arbitrary, not arbitrary, but you know, predetermined boundaries limiting. Our ability to travel, we're all meant to stay at home right now, so that's less of, of an issue. I hope that we can get to a position, and I, I can't put a date on this right now. I hope we can get to a position where um, we will be able to lift travel restrictions within Scotland completely. It, I think it will be uh, further into the future before we can lift international 
travel restrictions. Uh, so travel restrictions within Scotland priority, then travel restrictions within the UK would you know, be our next priority, I guess, and then I think international will be with us for a, a bit longer than that. Between now and then, yes, if we if we can't get to that end point as quickly as we all want, then how do we ease uh, the, the travel restrictions a bit and give people, as we hopefully are able to lift the stay-at-home restriction, as we ease up, as we did yesterday, the ability to meet outdoors, uh, moving to health board boundaries would give people not complete freedom to travel anywhere, but a bit more than they do just now. So uh, we want, I think the best way of summarising this is we want as quickly as possibly and as safely as possible to give people as much ability to interact with loved ones as possible. But we have to do it carefully, we have to do it cautiously, or the risk is, before we know it, we'll all be back under a stay-at-home order, which nobody ever wants to go back to. Mm -hmm. And very lastly, in the, the few seconds that I have left, First Minister, eh, when can you envisage our beloved football supporters getting back and to see their, their clubs legitimately, of course. Uh, do you see that happening in the near future or not? This is maybe a sensitive subject to be asking me about right right now. Um, I, I'm also conscious of the fact, and it's just one of the, the burdens of office, that anything I say about football has somebody or other deciding that I'm you know, the worst person ever. Um, I, I hope soon, um, you know, I, I hope that um, you know before too long, in some competition or other, fans will be able to be in Somerset Park to watch Air United beat Kelly. You know, but uh, I, can't put, I can't put a date on it right now. Um, what I do know is that we have, and you know, this has not been free of criticism. We have tried to keep uh, sport going um, or get it going again. Uh, after last year's lockdown, um, albeit behind closed doors, in order to give football fans the ability to watch their team, even if they can't be there in person. And I, I, you know, I know my, my dad, who, as you know, is an Air United supporter, he'd love to be on the terraces at Somerset Park, but being able to you know, log on and watch Air United has been something he's enjoyed at a time when people can't, can't do many of the things we enjoy. So that's why we've tried to keep uh, sport going Obviously, what happened at the weekend, you know, put huge, huge question marks in people's mind over whether that was the right thing to do or not, and and creates lots of anger on the part of many people. So we want to get sport back to normal as quickly as possible, just as we want to get everything back to normal as quickly as possible. But one of the the things COVID loves most are crowds of people coming together, and unfortunately, that's you know the the description of. Um, spectators at a football or a rugby match. So we need to do it carefully and cautiously. We might need to do it on a phased basis. But if we keep the figures going in the right direction right now, and if vaccines keeps going as it's going just now, then we can be really hopeful that all of these things are not too far in the future. Thank you so much for that, as ever. Thank you. Back to you, convener. Thanks, Willie. Um, our final set of questions come from John Mason. John. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener, and uh, uh, last but not least, um, if I can first of all, first minister, thank you very much indeed for the opening up for places of worship and churches, especially, and uh, I think that's very much appreciated by a lot of people. So uh, a lot of people are very grateful for that. Um, secondly, to kind of follow on a bit from where Willie Coffey was going, I, I think the police and the government have taken the line of engage, explain, encourage and enforce has only been a last resort. Do you feel that has largely been working? Yes, I do. Um, I, I think overall, uh, Police Scotland have responded very well uh, to the COVID crisis, and the approach that they have taken has been the right one. The vast majority of people have complied with all of the restrictions in place. The minority who have not Probably the majority of them have breached out of error or or ignorance of aspects of the regulations. And what the chief constable tells me regularly is most people who are, you know, stopped by the police or, you know, 
queried by the police will immediately rectify whatever it was that they were doing that wasn't correct. Then there's a, a much smaller minority who, you know, will exist in any society who, for whatever reason, they think COVID is a hoax or they don't like somebody like me telling them what to do, which nobody likes, <laughs> I, I can appreciate, will decide that they're not going to comply. And that's where enforcement, unfortunately, has to be there. Because in a, a situation like the one we're in right now, somebody who just deliberately and willfully refuses to comply with the restrictions, they're not just putting themselves at risk, they're putting other people at risk. And that's why enforcement has to be um, there as an option. And I think the police, by and large, uh, there will be you know, criticisms of the police at times, as there, there was at the weekend. Uh, but overall, I think they've taken a sensitive, a proportionate, and actually a really effective approach to this overall. Uh, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, secondly, we took evidence from New Zealand, and, and they are largely seen as having been quite successful in this, although still with a few issues. And in fact, they then also pointed to Taiwan as being one of the most successful countries. Do we have things we could have or we can learn from New Zealand and Taiwan going forward? Or is it because they are islands and kind of far away that it's just a lot easier for them? So I think there's a lot for us to learn from other countries, and New Zealand, Taiwan uh, would certainly be two that, that are in that category, and I think there's a lot to learn from New Zealand. Um, and you know there may be some things that other countries can look at us and learn from as well. So I think this learning uh, internationally is really important. That said, we're not New Zealand, and I, what I don't want to suggest is that well we we couldn't learn anything from New Zealand because they are so much further away, um, because that's not true. But equally, I don't think it's true to say we could have a hundred percent replicated the approach New Zealand took because it's uh, not so much because it's an island. Uh, Obviously, England, Wales, and uh, Ireland, uh, England, Wales, and Scotland are a, a, an island as well. But the, the geographic uh, positioning of New Zealand means that it is in a, a different position, and therefore, uh, different approaches would be more effective there than they would be here. The other thing that I think it's really important to remember, though, about any country is you can look at some countries and say they'd be more successful because they've kept case numbers lower, they've they've kept death numbers lower. But no country has managed to do that without paying a price for it. So New Zealand is paying a big price for the approach that it's taking. It's in the form of really, really strict border control, which will be impacting its economy, impacting tourism. You know, I think the New Zealand government have said in terms that it will be possibly not even this year uh, that uh, its borders will reopen. So they are they are paying a price, like we all are. They're, they've chosen what price to pay. Um, so there are balances here. There are some approaches that will work better in some countries than in others. But do we have a lot to learn? Absolutely, we do. I've said openly, uh, maybe too openly at times. Um, I think one of the the things that the UK and and other countries across Europe got wrong at the outset. So literally this time last year, was that we thought we were dealing with a flu pandemic. And the countries that had perhaps had SARS experience before probably were quicker to realise they were not dealing with a flu pandemic, and therefore the approaches they took uh, back in the very early days uh, were, were more appropriate. But these are may, just some of the many lessons that I think we have to, to be prepared to look critically at and learn when we get the time to do it. Again, thanks very much for that. And my third and final question, slightly closer to home: Our city centres and what is the future of the city centres? I mean, we, we've seen some major stores where I shop, I have to say, Debenhams and places like that, uh, closing. We've seen office workers get more used to working at home, and we don't know if they're going to return. Do you have any kind of vision for the city centres and where you think they might be going in the future? So I, I have thoughts, I've got ideas, I've got a sense of that. I think it's I think two things are important. I think we need to have a, a sort of proper open discussion about that as we come out of this crisis. And I think we've got to, while not hanging around to answer these questions too long, I think we've also got to recognise that it might just take a little bit of time to work out where some things are going to settle as we come out of this crisis. And I'll use home working as just, just a random example of that and and speak in really general terms. You know, back 
at the outset of this, you know, I was struck by the number of people that I would speak to that would say, our homework is so much better, you get so much more done, I never want to go back to working in an office. You know, many of these people now would say, I can't take homework in anymore, I need to get back to some kind of office. And so where will that settle? I don't think it will go back to as it was completely, but will it stay where it was at the outset of the pandemic? And we will have a period of readjustment to have to go through. And once we get a better sense of the world as it will be, as it will start to emerge, then some of these questions become easier to answer. The other thing with city centres we've got to remember is that some of the trends that have undoubtedly been accelerated and exacerbated by COVID were trends that were already underway because of online shopping out of town shopping centres. So some of this was there already. And I think there's a big challenge here for city and town centres, but we've got to try and see that as an opportunity to design these spaces where people will, in the future, go back to spending a lot of their time and a lot of their lives in a way that is fit for purpose. So I don't have all the answers to that, and nor should we try to too quickly come to all of the answers, but it is one of the, the key things that we have to work our way through in fairly short order. Thank you very much. Thank you, convener. Uh, th thank you for that. We do have a supplementary question from Monica Lennon. Uh, Monica, please ask your question. Thank you, convener, for coming back to me. Yeah, it was just to return to the, the citizens panel. I know the first minister was asked about it earlier on. Um, you'll know from the submissions expressed we, we is that it would be undemocratic for the first minister to be able to deliver the daily briefings during the pre-election period. There were some views expressed it would be better to allow officials, such as the National Clinical Director, to lead the briefings. And generally, some comments were made that scientists should be put front and centre in public communications. So can I just ask, First Minister, what are your intentions for the, the, the briefings? Um, will they be led by you and ministers, or will that be passed? to officials and advisors? So, we haven't come to a final uh, detailed decision on this right now, but it will not I mean, you know, already the daily briefings are happening less frequently. Um, I haven't done one this week. Uh, I didn't do it on Monday. Deputy First Minister did it on Monday and yesterday, today and tomorrow I will, you know, be answering questions in Parliament. So, you know, already the less frequent partly because of the parliamentary commitments obviously going into the election. Um, I remain First Minister, and ministers remain ministers, so we have to be accountable in during a, a health crisis. We have to have the ability to communicate directly with the public. But uh, again, some members will be more sceptical about this than others. I am a Democrat. I understand the importance of level playing fields in elections, and I will act appropriately. So you will uh, undoubtedly not have me doing daily briefings every day the way I have been doing them previously. But if there are big decisions that we are having to make during the election period, then I have a duty to communicate to the public what they are. It's open to Parliament to say that I should do that in Parliament rather than uh, a daily briefing and, and those discussions will be open to um, and so I, I suspect uh, you, you, you will be seeing more of, uh, even more than you have been over the last year of Gregor and Jason in terms of a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Um, I fully understand the importance of the election and democratic process, and it is not in my interest to, in any way to be seen to be abusing uh, the position of First Minister, and I will not absolutely not do that, while I will try to discharge my responsibilities as First Minister as, as best as I can. Uh, the other thing I would say, of course, is that you know, I, whatever I decide in terms of doing uh, briefings when I think it is necessary, and this applies at all times, uh, I do not decide what the broadcasters broadcast. It is the broadcasters who decide what they broadcast. Uh, and broadcasters you know, have duties in terms of uh, impartiality and in terms of balance in their coverage. And already we see, I know the BBC, I obviously don't get to watch it because I'm doing the thing, but the BBC uh, now have other parties represented on the coverage of their briefings. So, you know, it will not be business as normal during the election campaign, um, but we will still be in a crisis and therefore we need to make sure that we're serving the public appropriately. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes our evidence session with both the First Minister and the Chief Medical Officer this afternoon. Can I take this opportunity to thank you again for your time and your evidence this morning? Uh, it's much appreciated by everyone on the committee. Uh, the committee will meet again tomorrow morning to take the motions on various regulations. And that concludes uh, the public part of our meeting this morning. And can I now suspend the meeting to allow members to change over to a different uh, platform? Thank you very much.